Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. For your love. And that demonstration of your love by sending your son here oh, to Calvary to provide a cleansing for sin-sick hearts. We're so thankful that you just fill us yes, with Lord. your presence. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. Glory. Glory. Oh, my. As we think of what you've done in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. As the blood was applied. Oh, thank you, Lord. And hearts were cleansed and brought into your family. Oh, by the blood. And to experience your presence in their yes. lives. We're so thankful. Yes. And Lord, we just pray that this Sunday you would stir this church. Oh, yes, Lord. And Lord, we just Wake pray us up. That your Holy Spirit would go from one side to the other. Woo. And Lord, touch Mighty hearts. rushing wind. Lord, in as you touch their hearts, we just pray that you would fill them with joy. Yes, Jesus, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this church. I think of a phrase that is so important in front of this altar. That this is holy ground. Amen. And Lord, we wait for you. Even so come. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would just uh, anoint this service. Praise Jesus. And Lord, we pray for the pastor. Help us, Lord. Oh, Lord, that you would just reach down deep in his heart. Mm. And preach with such fire. Thank you, Lord. And... Lifted up by your Holy Spirit. Praise God. And so, Heavenly Amen. Father, we ask this this morning. Oh, and we shall give you all the yes, glory. Hallelujah. And all the glory. Glory to God. In Jesus' praise precious name. Amen. 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 God sent his son. Yes, he did. They called him Jesus. He came to love. You Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is it's gone. gone. And because I know, yes, I know, he holds the future, and life is worth the living just. Because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he is, but greater still. Come on, church. That God you got something to place him about. can face uncertain days because he lives. And God lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. All fear is gone. And because I know. Just because he lives. Oh, so listen my. to this. And then one day, just one day, I'll cross, I'll cross that river, little river. I'll fight life's fight. No war with pain. And then as death, it's gonna happen. Oh yes, gives, gives away to it. 
I'll see the light of glory and for oh, I know he lives and because he lives oh, I can face tomorrow because he is all my fear is it's gone and because I know yes I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives one more time it's because he lives, oh, because he lives, I can face my every tomorrow, because he lives, all my fear is gone, all my fear is gone, and because I know, yes I know, he holds the future, and life is worth the living just. Because he lives, he lives. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! Sing that chorus through one more time. One more time. Sure enough. Because he lives. Think about it, man. Come on. I can face. Oh, give him some praise today. Because he lives. All your fear is gone, it's gone, and because I know, yes I know, He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. Oh, because that God lives. Shout it out, Amen. Praise God trustworthy Savior, Mark chapter 15, and verses 1 through 15 is where we'll be today. We've been examining Mark, and we've been seeing his vivid narrative of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. These events were choreographed by the Father from the very beginning of time. Calvary and what happened at the cross, what happened at the tomb, all that was not just a mere mistake or a coincidence. God knew from the very beginning what would occur. He knew from the very beginning when he formed Adam and gave him the breath of life and Eve. He knew the plight. He knew what mankind was going to do. And so he would be, and knowing that, he knew that we would need a Redeemer. And so the whole process from the Old Testament right on through the, the prophecies that were given and the words that were spoken were all leading up to what would happen at the cross. So behind the black backdrop of the setting we find is the shining glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In all the dark places of your living that you find yourselves in the struggles the pains, the heartaches, the headaches, everything that you go through. Behind all of that, though, there's a shining day because a Redeemer who shines in your heart and your life is greater than whatever you're facing in life. Amen. Divinely speaking, God is the true power. And God is the true influence bringing His own Son to the cross. It was not what happened in the garden. It was not what happened in the what we're going to see in the trial and what we talked about last week. All that was a part of the plan of God, divinely orchestrated of God, that Jesus would be our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Lord. God is the one who is pleased to kill His Son as substitutionary sacrifice for all of our sins. As the word says, He became sin who knew no sin. He bore the sins of all mankind. So it's often said that silence is golden. You've heard that phrase, I'm sure. And in the text before us today, it is also glorious that silence is golden. 
It is the, it's glorious because ultimately the silence of Jesus was gracious. It was of the graciousness of our God that Jesus would come and bear our sins on the cross. We shout about the resurrection. But we better shout about the cross too. Because that's where the sins were laid. That's where the price was paid. That's where everything that was against you was nailed to a cross. That cross and that resurrection provides the hope that you have today. And if you don't have that hope, thank God you can have it before you leave this building. Amen. So, his silence had everything to do with our salvation. As we're going to read in just a few moments in the scriptures. So, his silence gives us power of Alba Father. Even when we experience the pains of evil and the injustice that comes sometime in life. Sometimes silence then becomes our best defense. Sometimes silence is actually louder than words. In the world today, oh listen, this world we today, we see the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the slandered victim was a silent victor. He was silent, but he was our victory. Amen. Amen. He fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, the great prophet, talking about the suffering of the servant. And Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. There is the silence. He is brought as a lamb before the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. See, even in his silence, you know what? His silence screamed love for you and I. Amen. The righteous silence of Jesus actually screamed the good news of the gospel. Because the gospel is inclusive of not only the resurrection, but the crucifixion. And all the things that Christ would suffer Jesus accepted his assignment as man's substitute and he did it willingly. He died for you and me. He laid it all down. He came down from the beauty, the splendor, the majesty of the Father and came down to be a sin bearer and to die for our sins. And to be a substitute. That's something to shout about. Amen. He endured. He endured the false accusations of the Jewish leaders. He endured the political maneuvering of the Roman governor. And the rejection even of the crowd. He, Jesus, went through it all. Because there was an ultimate purpose behind his actions. There was something that God was going to do. And that one thing is contained in two words. Mankind's redemption. Everything that he suffered, went through, and encountered was to buy your redemption. Amen. Now the word of God. Mark 15, 1 through 15. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest says, this is very, very early. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Pilate is the governor. Pilate asked him, aren't thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto them, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? 
Behold how many things they have witnessed against thee, all in false accusations. But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate was marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas. Note that name, Barabbas. In that name is also a name called Abba, A-B-B-A. Pick that out. I'll tell you about it in a moment. Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had many insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to be as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. They were afraid of Jesus. The chief priest moved the people. You know what that means? That means that the chief priests were working through the audience, through the crowd that morning, prompting them, telling them what to say. And he said that he should release, rather release, and release Barabbas unto them. He was setting up the stage. Jesus was a threat to the Roman government and to their position and to the high priest. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! That riveted, that sound, those words just were so loud and boisterous through the crowd. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! It was just riveting. It was intense. And it must be done. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Let's step back a moment. You remember the years of the 80s? The years of the 80s. It was a time of big hairdos and men with mullets. Real mullets. Not the mullets you catch to eat. Mullets in the hair. 1982 was the year a Canadian rock band named Loverboy. Yeah, sounds like some of you have heard that name before. Had a hit song titled, Everybody is Working for the Weekend. Yeah. Actually, that phraseology of the weekend started back many years ago right here in America. That's where we got that idea of the weekend and enjoyment and things like that. 20 years before, it was 1965, there was a man by the name of Alan Stellman, a perfume salesman in New York, and he opened a restaurant near the airport, hopeful to meet airline attendants, and he also had his eye on some airline stewardess. The restaurant he opened was one that you're familiar with, it was called TGIF. Thank goodness it's Friday. People looking forward to Fridays. But in the text, we come to a Friday that was not a good Friday for Jesus. So this Friday was like no other Friday that had ever been experienced in history. In the passage today, it's very early in the in the morning on a Friday. Later that day, after the denial and after everything that had happened and after the pronouncement of Jesus to be beaten, scourged with a cat of nine tails and ultimately to go to the cross and realizing for Jesus it had been an agonizing 24 hours for him. Jesus had been depleted in 
Gethsemane's garden. He was betrayed by Judas. He was denied by Peter. And he's been abandoned by all of his friends. The disciples had scattered. They left. And they left their identification with him in fear. He had been interrogated by the chief priest. He had been falsely accused by the Sanhedrin. And he had been beaten by the crowd. And even spat upon by the scribes. And the end of the text, he is stripped. His hands are tied upon a post. And he is beaten. This Friday here makes all other Fridays, however, worthwhile in the sense of what Jesus did because this is the Friday listen church this is the Friday that sets the stage for Jesus to save us amen so walking through the passage here we find some things early in the morning the chief priest had a plan and it must be done quickly because Shabbat was coming at sundown and nothing else could be done during that time. They delivered Jesus over to Pilate. Pilate is the governor in Jerusalem. Pilate was a politician, very careful to maintain his status and to maintain his position. He was also a very cruel man. Pilate had the power, and he had Jewish worshipers killed. The chief priests had many charges against Jesus. None of them, it was a kangaroo court. What they accused Jesus was, really, if you look at it in the true sense, he was guilty, but he was guilty of love in the first degree. Pilate didn't care about the accusations of blasphemy about him being God. So Jesus was accused of wanting to be a king. Actually, what Jesus was doing, he was fulfilling the prophecy and specifically the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. Pilate thought he had Jesus on trial. When, when you really look at this in the true lens of what is here, it's really Jesus having Pilate on trial. He possessed the power that he could have released Jesus in spite of what the crowd had said. He could have had Barabbas, who was a murderer, who was a criminal, who was deserving to die, he could have had him get his just due. But Pilate chose the political route. And an interesting note here, because we read in the other Gospels about Pilate's wife. And had she said, and you remember, she said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. And I'll tell you this, even today in the Ethan Orthodox religion, Pilate's wife is a saint amongst them. She is called Saint Claudia Procuma, the keeper of the gate. It is even said, as I did some research, that it is thought that she later, after Jesus was crucified, she gave her life to Christ. I hope she did. But Pilate didn't listen to his wife a prisoner would be released. And there was a murderous man by the name of Barabbas. A person who would be released. It would be, rather than Jesus, who should have been released, it would be Barabbas. The crowd cried, Release Barabbas! Crucify! Crucify! And the sound of the people was so intense it was deafening. Jesus would be scourged. His hands, as I told you, would be affixed to a pole. He'd be stripped of his robe and his clothing. And he'd be scourged until his flesh was ripped in shreds, even in places to the bone. Many had even died through the scourging. See, we lose sight of this. We have Easter and we take a couple of weeks and we remember, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, okay. And then we have the, the resurrection. Oh, hallelujah. We forget about that could not have been a resurrection if there had not been a cross 
an execution chamber of death for Jesus. He died there, ladies and gentlemen. The blood that not only he suffered and shed at the cross, he also shed at that execution chamber where he was scourged and beaten and left as a bloody mass. Body even being unrecognizable. His body was covered with stripes and lacerations and blood and pain. All this then gives us the theme for today. I know this has been heavy, but let me tell you something here. You can trust Jesus with your soul, with your life, and with your future. Amen. Praise God. The cross, the journey to the cross is significant. Let me give you five easy, quick points. One, you've got to trust his timing. Mark implies the events happened by divine appointment. So that means then the cross was not accidental, was it? It was a divine appointment. Jesus would be hung up for our hang-ups of sin. He would die our death. He would took, take our shame. He would take our sins and nail it to the cross. Amen. And what happens in your life is not accidental, but by divine appointment. There is no luck in living. Church, you need to get that in your vocabulary. There is no luck in living. What happens in your life and what God permits is by divine appointment for God to work in your life. We don't like the pains, the agonies, the struggles, and all the things that come to us that we have to face. But God permits these things to happen. To develop you. To bless you. To increase your faith and your trust in Him. So you don't look at the door of getting out of what you're going through. You look to the God who will bring you through that victory that He has for you. But in that, listen, in that process of bringing about that victory, is God working and tooling and bringing a lesson to strengthen us, to make us strong. For Paul declared, Oh, when I am weak, then I, am I made strong. I stopped in a little place downtown yesterday. I would filmed the uh, bit that I did on Facebook. Have you ever, have you, if you haven't watched it, you need to see it. It's good. I go to these places and film that maybe you don't recognize. So I'll tell you where I was at. I was downtown on Monument Terrace. If you go by, the police department's on the other side of the street, so I knew it would be safe there. And so I, I got on the elevator and went down to the entrance where the clerk of court is at. And there was a nice table sitting there. And I thought, man, this is perfect setting. I like to go to places that there's no one around so that I don't have distractions. I don't have people walking in front of me. I don't have people coming looking over my shoulder. You know. But in that process of talking about things in life, and waiting on God and His waiting and His timing it's never an accident because whatever you are in so after I gave that little lecture lesson on that I thought well I'm going to go down to Main Street there's a little place a little hole in the wall that I like to eat at it's called Hot and Cold so I like Indian food so I went in and had some Hot and Cold so the owner the chef and his wife are both born again Christians. So I spent probably 30 minutes talking to his wife about life, Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, and the victory that God gives us. And we were talking about the struggles in life. This lady had just had knee replacement done. So I was talking and I said, You know, we so many times think the things that happen in our life are bad and they come to us. She said, yes, they are. And I said, yes, but they're there for a purpose. And I lived through one of those purpose places in my life. And I said, as I was in the hospital and 
gone through what I went through and had my legs. She said, you don't have, what are you like? Hey, you walk. I said, on prosthetic legs. Both of them. Praise God. And I said, you know, as I was laying there and, and going through the processes of trying to get my life back by the grace of God, I was drawn into 2 Corinthians 12. Paul was talking there and he talked about the sufficiency of God's grace. And that even in the low, hard places, when you don't understand and you cry out, God, take this from me, deliver me, lift me out of this, Lord, help me in this place that I'm in. There, God, he says simply this, as he said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Come on, church. That grace that was sufficient for Paul. That grace that was sufficient for your recycled pastor. It came back to haunt you, didn't it? Well, that grace is sufficient for you. That grace will bring you through what you're facing. That grace will get you off of the sick bed. That grace will bring healing to your body. That grace will bring healing to your family. That grace will bring healing to your mind, your soul, your spirit. Because Paul said, when I am down, when I am weak, then I am I strong. Praise God. That grace will get you through what you're in. Right? That grace will lift you up, right? That grace will bring you through the valley of the shadow. Amen. You've got to trust God's timing. And instead of looking for the door, the curtain of life to get out of what you in, why don't you look at what God's trying to teach you in that timing of that moment of what he's trying to develop in your life to make you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. You know what King David said? King David said, my times are in your hands and yours are in God's hands. Don't be saying, I just wish the Lord would take me. Well, he's not going to do it until he calls you. So stop talking foolish. Start praying. Help, Lord, show me what you want. Show me where you're taking me. Help me in what I'm in. God, speak to my heart. And I'll tell you, on the authority of God's word and on what God did in my life, he will speak to you, and he will not only speak to you, but he will speak to you abundantly, exceedingly. And he will bring you through what you're going through. Amen. Sure, there are times when life is not what we hope for. You've got to be a Romans 8, 28 Christian when you're waiting because you've got to trust God. Nudge your name and say, you've got to trust God. Tell him. There's nobody beside you. Touch somebody behind you, in front of you. Tell him again, you've got to trust God. And you better look back at them and say, yeah, you better learn to do the same thing. Amen. <laughs> while you're waiting, hear me, church. While you're waiting, you've got to worship Him. Amen. Don't live in self-pity and defeat. You've got to worship Him. And while you're waiting, ask God to give you the contentment that is only found in Jesus Christ. Ask God to make the joy of the Lord your strength wow praise God the joy of the Lord is my strength to lift up my hands and to shout and praise God hallelujah I wish I could jump over pews again maybe I'll continue to build my arms up and I can just take and swing over them amen I'm telling you folks the joy of the Lord is your strength. And too many of you are living in the down and outs. You've got your mouth turned down. You're worried about everything and anything. Today you need the joy of the Lord. And you need to stop worrying. And start worshiping. And start praising. And start giving God glory. And trusting the God. Who will give you strength. In the storm. The joy. 
of the Lord is my strength. Whew. I wish I had some joyful Christians in these pews today. I, I said I wish I had some joyful Christians in this church today. I wish I had some people that are not ashamed to let their little joy ring in their life and show a little bit of joy of their love for God. Come on church. It's time we become the joyful people that God has called us to be. Amen. Sit back down. You got to trust his rule. Trust God. Trust God that he's in control. No, not you. You're not in control. Because when you get in control, you screw it up and mess it up. Amen. It's the authority, the power, and the greatness of Jesus that is in control in your life. The Roman pilot, this Roman pilot is, is going to crucify and have Christ put to death. And in less than 300 years, listen to this, in less than 300 years, Christianity will then become the official religion of Rome. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart in the times that we live. We've got to trust God's rule. And whoever is and whoever shall be president, your rule is not there. Your rule is at the throne. Amen. <laughs> trust God. He'll work it all out. Don't worry about it. Don't fret over it. Don't drive yourself crazy with it. Just smile and say, hallelujah, I'm trusting God. He's got it all under control. He can do the amazing. He can do the marvelous. He can do the exceeding. He can do the abundant. He can do it all because the Lord is still in control. This world is in a chaotic mess. But if you'll read your Bible, come on church, if you'll get down to the depths of God's word and read what happens in the last days, come on, you know what's going to happen? It means that we're right on the threshold of the day when the King of kings and the Lord of lords will step out on the cloud and say, come up hither and we'll be changed in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Trust his rule. Trust, thirdly, his suffering. You know, this is awesome. Because Jesus took the shame and suffering and he did it not by accident, but he did it intentionally. Jesus gave meaning to suffering. Praise God. Praise God there is one who has gone before us and has taken the sting out of death and the sting out of shame. Christ not only takes away sin, but he takes away the shame of sin. If you are redeemed in the Lord, I hope you are. Whatever is in your past, whatever you messed up, whatever today you were bad in or did or whatever, in Christ, if you've asked him to forgive you, it is gone. The shame has been removed. Stop living, as I tell you so many times, stop living in the rear view mirror of where you were and what you were in and what you did. That is gone. It's under the blood. It's as far as the east as from the west. It shall never be remembered again. Start today praising God. You're not that no more, but you're a child of the living God, a king, a priest, and belonging to the king of kings. Amen. All that says this, you then now are a trophy of the grace of God. Fourth, trust the gospel. That's the only thing you can trust today. Can't trust these politicians because they are steeped in lies. Amen. Promise you the moon and they drop it. Mark 15 is the gospel of Really, now listen to what I'm going to say. This will strike you a minute. This is the gospel of Barabbas. The name Barabbas, as I told you as I was reading the scripture, you know what it means? Son of the Father. The sinless Son of God the Father will take the place of the lawless Son of, human, of a human father. Did you hear what I just said? This is what I call substitutionary atonement. 
for in the name Barabbas is Abba. Daddy, Father, but we don't use Abba by itself. We call him Abba, Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed is his name. His kingdom come. Come on, church. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. This is the picture of the guilty being set free and the innocent taking his place. And that's a, what a, how God does what he does is so amazing to me. They didn't arbitrarily just choose Barabbas to bring out there. That was not an accident. He didn't get lucky that day. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, I've often thought of this. Can you imagine Jesus standing there and taking the place of every one of those who cried out, crucify him? He was scared to death, Barabbas was, that he was going to be the one that would be executed on a cross, which is a traumatic, horrible, horrific death. And this Jesus looks at him, and I believe that in Jesus' eyes, when he looked at Barabbas, I believe there was mercy in his eyes. And I believe Barabbas saw it. We don't know what happened to Barabbas, but I promise you, I bet that guy was never the same. Considering that Jesus died on the cross for him. And this is what Jesus has done for you and I. He's taken us who are unrighteous and makes us righteous. He died that we could be in this church and live in him today. This is the gospel. And you've got to put your faith and your hope in Jesus alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. There's no other way. There is eternal life. Don't weep for me. I'm counting on going by the rapture. I'm going to leave somebody else these prosthetic legs. I hope it fits. They won't eat them long. They only wear them seven years. Amen. <laughs> Some of you will at me and say, huh? Duh, what are you talking about? Read your Bible, you'll find out. We have eternal life in Christ if we're saved. Aren't you glad of that? That's enough to say praise God over. Amen? Let me throw one more at you and I'm through. Trust His healing and His forgiveness. God may heal you physically. He will heal you spiritually. He doesn't always heal us physically, and there's a reason for that. We have to trust God for that. I like the way Isaiah put it. Here he talked about Jesus, talking about him dying, talking about him suffering, talking about him being the sin substitute. And then we get down and he says this. But, but is a conjunction. He ties all that suffering to what's going to happen here. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. Say it with me if you, if you know the scripture. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with, say it loud and proud, and with his stripes we are healed. Praise God. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. There by faith I see my sight and now I am happy all the day at the cross we're forgiven the punishment is on Jesus and the love is on you and I when you receive him and receive his love into your life you can trust Jesus and my question as I close have you trusted him in salvation?